Not a problem, write a short test, and by test I mean a function that calls your function and examines the output. Is it what you expect it to be? We'll write a new test so that the next time you work on this project or code, you're not going to make that same mistake again because that new test will detect the mistake that you've just made. So this is generally known as unit testing. So we'll also talk in the course about user experience. So this is kind of the silly, sexy term that people use to describe user experience these days. And it really refers to the design of user interfaces and the actual UI that humans interact with. And I do recall finally from CS50 the past couple of years how we've assigned you the task of critiquing some piece of hardware or software with which you find fault, most of which were uh, within somewhere harvard.edu. Um, but it's that kind of discussion we'll have. So as not to just pick on and bash on uh, badly designed software or hardware, but to actually think about what is it that makes that particular tool that you might all be about to use so bad, right? And how can you avoid those same pitfalls? And what can you do better? So we'll be on the lookout throughout the semester for things folks do well and things folks do less well. Performance too. And here's something where the mobile context allows us to have interesting conversations. On a mobile device, even if you're on Wi-Fi, there's typically higher latency, whereby just to start getting that web page to download takes a few more milliseconds, or dare say seconds. And so you can't assume the same seamless interface that a user might have on a really nice broadband connection. So does that mean your user is destined to have a crappy experience on their phone? So not necessarily, right? If you engineer the software right, you can do really fancy things with JavaScript, with Objective-C, with other languages so that you can use caching, save information that you want to be able to access quickly. You can do preemptive requests so that if the user almost always goes from option one to two, why not get both option one and two at the same time so that when he or she clicks option two, voila, you have the data waiting. And so this is what makes some applications for instance, Gmail's web app for the iPhone and Android is really quite good. And it feels pretty zippy because when you hit send, it's not actually sending your mail instantly, especially if you're offline, but it's caching it in some local storage and it's actually sending it off when it has the opportunity. So engineering software um, that's compelling even in the face of these constraints is non-trivial. So we'll also talk about some industry standard best practices and the like. So source control. So source control, some of you used whether Git or something else in 50 or some other course, refers to really the process of making automated backups of your own code or really auto, uh, different versions of your own code. And this does not, and Tommy gave a seminar on this this past fall, this does not mean using the CP command ad nauseum to make this is pset1 underscore 2, pset1 underscore 3. Right, and I am guilty of this to date all too often. But the problem with this is that it becomes super hard to find. Where is that version where everything did work? It would be nice if I had annotations within my code so that I know what version this actually was. And once you start working with a partner, right, you're not going to want to be emailing your code back and forth and say, here, download the latest version of my file and test it with yours. Wouldn't it be nice if you could run one command, download automatically his or her code into your own folder, and voila, you now have the fresh copy of everyone's code involved. So we'll look at and use constantly tools like uh, Git, an alternative to which is subversion. Uh, but more on those over time. Um, IDEs. So gedit, it's not really an IDE. It's actually not bad. And it's much better than nano if you took 50 a couple of years ago. because it OK, a few of you did. So because you can at least use the mouse, right? Which is a nice advancement over the command line uh, only. <laughs> But there exist more sophisticated tools, for better or for worse. For instance, we did ship the CS50 appliance last year with Eclipse, but then decided not to use it, because frankly, it's a big piece of slow software that's not all that great to use, but it is incredibly common, incredibly popular. But one IDE that we will use in this class, mostly by necessity, but also um, in a good way, is Xcode, which is actually one of the best IDEs I've used, albeit tied to one platform in particular. But more on platforms in a moment. But we'll look to it, the course, at PHP Frameworks. So the, the feature of coding I alluded to earlier, whereby you factor out your HTML tag, your head tags, maybe even the image tag and logo and the footer tags and the like, you can actually make all of that happen so much more easily by building your application on top of someone else's, what's generally called a framework, which means you get a bunch of functions out of the box that you can then call to make your life easier. And one of the frameworks we'll look at is a very user-friendly one called CodeIgniter for PHP, which will allow you to really just focus on writing one or more templates for a web browser or mobile browser that will allow you to emphasize uh, write code, your logic, your business logic inside of special 
classes called models that are really going to contain the intelligence of your application, and then wire those things together with these other types of entities called、uh, controllers, thus the C in MVC. And we'll start looking at that as soon as next week. And we'll also look at a number of JavaScript libraries, among them jQuery and its companion jQuery Mobile, which makes it ever so much easier nowadays to actually make mobile friendly, device,、uh, mobile -friendly websites for mobile devices, as well as some fancier tools. That allow you to really have interactive experiences, even in a mobile context like Node.js, Socket.io, that allow you to have essentially real time communications between server and browser without bringing the server to its knees by having hundreds or thousands of users all using your site or your application at once. You might have seen one such、uh, usage of these libraries. So, if you went to the CS50 Fair this week,、uh, this past、uh, fall, we whipped up really in just a night this application here, thanks to Tommy, that used jQuery Mobile. We pulled in a whole bunch of Data based on the、uh, form submissions that the students in 50 made、um, describing their projects. And then this is so part of this is fake. So this is just a screenshot. So I can't actually click on this. But if I do go to the background here, this is a iPhone in a window that comes with this program called Xcode. This is just a link to the Safari browser, specifically going to fair.cs50.net. And what you're able to do is create the illusion of this is what happens when more than two people try to use wireless in Harvard Hall.、Um, <laughs> If you click projects, you can then browse to Android apps. You can go to Ali's app, and voila, here was、uh, Ali's app for the CS50 Fair. But notice the transitions that we had between pages, right? It looks nice, right? It looks reminiscent of Android and iOS, but it's a web browser. And so, one of the things you get by using these kinds of libraries is all of that functionality without having to write the low level JavaScript code that would be involved in taking an image and then sliding it a pixel, and then a pixel, and then a pixel, and then a pixel. Then a pixel. These are Not the interesting problems in life, unless what your goal is is to write a library that animates、uh, images on the screen. But if you're more interested in implementing a CS50 Fair、uh, attendance application, well, you just want to leverage these kinds of things. And so we'll look not just at what exists, which in itself is not all that interesting, but how these things have been implemented so that you yourself might integrate with them or build your own. And we'll also look finally at SDKs, software development kits. These are tools that you use, really IDEs and other tool components. Compilers with which to build actual software. And among the tools we'll look at is Xcode. So, Xcode is this sort of free, if you have the right OS,、um, copy of an IDE、uh, designed by Apple. That if we fire it up here, let me go over to Xcode here. Let me start a new project. Let me go here. So, new project. So, this is, I am using the IDE, Integrated Development Environment, called Xcode. Also installed in my computer is the SDK, Software Development Kit for iOS, which is the operating system that runs on Apple's hardware. I'm going to go ahead and choose from this generic menu here something called the Single View Application, but we'll come back to this over time. I'm going to just make a program called Hello and hit Next. And what this IDE is going to do for me is really, at the end of the day, just create a new empty file. But it's not quite a new empty file because what you'll get With IDEs like this, is a lot of template code, starting boilerplate code that you're welcome to delete, but it's a little easier typically to start filling in the blanks. Much like early P sets in 50, where we hand you some skeletal code and you start filling in the blanks. Now, I'm not going to even write any code. I'm going to go over to this nib file over here, and there is the beginnings of an amazing iPhone application. I'm going to go ahead and drag a label here. I'm going to go ahead and say, Hello world. I'm going to recenter it. Give it that fancy feature. And then, this is how easy it is to program these days. I'm going to hit the play button. And then, voila, in a few seconds, the IDE has built my code and whew, my first iPhone application. And soon yours. <laughs> Thank you. So, I promise we will do more interesting things than that. And programming for the iPhones is not as simple as dragging and dropping. This isn't really Scratch. <laughs> But if that's your objective, I mean, you might be could sell that for 99 cents.、Um, it can、uh, facilitate the design of such things. So, now structurally for this course. So, in lectures, we'll meet just once a week on Mondays, one to three. And the goal of lectures really is to provide you with a mental model for the week and really for the month's project, the concepts that you'll be leveraging, the ideas and techniques. And so, in lectures, we'll be introduced once every Monday some new set of ideas that hopefully you can then leverage for the current or for some. Future project. For the course, there will be four projects、uh, divvied up as follows. There will be two staff choice projects.
projects, which means we spec them out and specify what you need to implement for us, and two students choice projects, which means exactly that. You get to design and propose your own final, uh, your own project, much like, say, the final project in CS50. Um, the structure of the projects are such that the first two will be web apps, which will mean writing HTML and JavaScript and PHP and the like, so that the output is a web-based application that can play on your own mobile phones, in the simulator that I just pulled up there for iOS, or even in a desktop browser where you can simulate a mobile device, frankly, by just shrinking the screen. In fact, the browser will recommend for development purposes is Chrome. Um, Chrome is built on an open source browser framework called WebKit. And what's nice about this is that WebKit underlies the browsers in Android and iOS. So you get two of the biggest um, two of the biggest players there standardizing essentially on this platform. And so even though we preached Firebug, even though uh, Internet Explorer exists, um, we'll find that we'll get <laughs> a lot of bang for our buck, at least for now, in using Chrome. Um, because its tools are so um, increasingly universal. Um, so for these projects, you'll see the following kind of release cycle. So for each project, there'll be five milestones that you need to meet. So on a Monday, we would release the specification, whether it's do this or uh, propose what you want to do. A couple of days later, you'll submit a proposal, which will be just be a few sentences or paragraphs, which in the case of the staff's choice, you tell us who's going to do what. So you'll have to have a quick caucus over the course of those couple of days and just try to divvy up the work. Who's going to do which pieces of the problems, and you can change that over time, but the idea is to figure out who is going to proceed initially in doing what. A few days later on the following Monday, a design document and a style guide will be due. So design documents are not going to be some formal thing that we prescribe the format of, but rather whatever process you think will work best for you. Frankly, when I've collaborated with friends on various projects, sometimes we just work at a whiteboard, we take a photograph of it, and bam, that's our design for that piece of the puzzle. And so doing something as, as simple as that and then just uploading it to the equivalent of a Google document so that you and your partner have a common starting point and have made some design decisions in advance that both you and he or she can commit to will help expedite this process. But we'll explain in the first specification exactly what kinds of things you should think about and what kinds of things you should propose. And the goal here especially if you think you're kind of thinking ahead of the game. Oh, well, I'll just write my design document afterward. So I used to do this all the time, right? Back in the day when I took 50, we actually had to write for presets design documents bef uh, and submit them with the problem sets. And I was one of those kids who would write the problem set and then reverse engineer the design document based on the perfect sort of ideas I had from the beginning. But this does not work well for larger programs, and it does not work well when you're working with someone else, right? It's sort of just logical that if you're working with someone else, you kind of have to have that conversation at the beginning, not at the end of the project. And so this will be an opportunity to really start fleshing out the ideas for your project. And what I think you'll sometimes find is you might end up spending more of your time in a room at a whiteboard talking about, debating about how to go about implementing something, writing a pseudocode, whether on a board or in a document, and then spending less time actually implementing it. And in fact, if you've done that, that's a really good thing because it means you sort of fleshed out all of the corner cases, thought through all of the design challenges, and then the coding part is easy because you know exactly what it is you then need to implement. Now, that too is one of those things that eh, not going to happen that way, most likely the first, maybe even the second, the third, or the fourth time. But that's the ideal to strive for, to spend more time arguing with each other, talking about design, and then less time ultimately coding and debugging. Because indeed, you'll have less, fewer problems to fix if you've thought through all the more. So after the proposal and then design document and style guide, you'll have to release your first beta. And the beta version of your software is meant to be as, as solid and as correct as you think it now is. But a few people will likely disagree. Because a few days later, on a Wednesday, we'll be due code reviews for multiple classmates. So the design of the class will be such that when you submit the beta version of your code on behalf of you and your partner, so you do work together, you submit the same code, the two of you, um, we will then assign to one or more of your other classmates your code to then review, to bang on and try to find bugs, to critique that why do you have five nested for loops, to point out that it would have been nicer to read this with actual comments, and getting feedback not just from your teaching fellow, but from class classmates who might be better at programming than you, who might be weaker at programming than you, but in both cases will you get the perspectives of people that you might end up um, working with or collaborating with, indeed even among the programmers who you think are 
You know, who are they to tell me how to write code? Well, if they're having trouble reading your code, like it's not as good as you think it is, right? If it's not all that readable. And so also will the teaching fellows weigh in with feedback of their own so that then um, by the following Monday, you'll have an opportunity with your partner to retool, to go back and fix the design mistakes that you made or others have dis uh, uh, proposed that you've made and actually improve that so that you can ship your proper version of this a week later. And so this is something we just don't have time for in 50, right? Quite often, where you spend all these hours on your project, you think it's right, or maybe you know it's not quite right, but by the time you get that feedback, we're into the next cycle of another project. In this class, the goal will be to actually ship something that you feel is production quality, and it's not uh, still with bugs, with design flaws, or with stylistic mistakes.